Electric quantities. We start with a discussion of Ohm's law. Electric circuits run on three basic principles and quantities. The first one is voltage, also known as potential difference. You'll hear us interchanging between these two words, voltage and potential difference. Voltage is given the symbol capital V and is defined as the energy of the electrons. Voltage is measured in volts. The unit is given the symbol capital V as well. The second quantity is current, and current is given the symbol capital I. It's defined as how quickly electrons are moving around. And the current is measured in amperes, or amps, and the symbol for amperes is capital A. The third electrical quantity is resistance, and resistance is defined as the hindrance to the flow of electrons. Resistance is measured in ohms, and ohms are represented by the Greek letter omega. Omega is the unit for ohms. In this diagram, we see that the voltage character is providing the energy, energy to push the electrons through a conductor or a wire. How quickly the electron moves through the wire is defined as the current and is measured in amps. And resistance is the hindrance of electron flow through a wire. The more resistance, the more difficult it is for an electron to flow through a wire. These three quantities have a mathematical relationship. The relationship between resistance, current, and potential difference is called Ohm's law. Ohm's law is defined as the potential difference across a load increases, and so does the current. If the potential difference increases, then so does the current. We have an equation for resistance, potential difference, and current. And the equation is resistance equals potential difference over current. We can write this equation in an equation triangle. You may have seen these before. If you're looking to solve one of these quantities, you need to solve, cover the quantity you're looking for. For example, if we're looking for voltage, we are left with I and R. And this line in between I and R means multiplied. So potential difference is equal to I times R. We can use this equation triangle to find resistance. Cover the R and we are left with potential difference divided by current. This line means divided by. Finally, if we're looking for current, if we cover the current, we are left with potential difference divided by R. Let's try an example. Sample problem number one. A load has 1.2 amps of current flowing through it. I'm highlighting the quantity, and if there are clues as to what this quantity is, such as if they name it, here they do, they name it current, I'll highlight current as well. If they didn't name it, I know that the symbol A represents current. The voltage across the load is 6.0 volts. I'm highlighting the clues and the measurement. So the voltage is 6.0 volts. Calculate the resistance. This is what they want us to find. So let's write down everything that's given and everything that's required. We have 1.2 amps of current, and current is given the symbol I. We have 6.0 volts of voltage or potential difference, and that is given the symbol 
capital V. And they want us to find the resistance. Let's determine which equation we're going to use. If we're calculating resistance, we're going to cover the R, and using the equation triangle, we are left with V divided by I. So resistance is equal to V divided by I. Our next step is to solve. We're going to sub in our values. Resistance is, is equal to 6 volts divided by 1.2 amps. Now use your calculator to solve this equation. We have... 6 divided by 1.2. If you did this correctly, you should end up with 5. And the unit for resistance is the Greek letter omega. Let's give a therefore statement. Therefore, the resistance of the load is 5.0 ohms. When solving these problems on a quiz or a test, you will get marks for writing down what's given. You will get marks for what, writing down what's required. A mark for writing the equation properly rearranged using the equation triangle. And you'll get marks for subbing and solving the equation properly. Make sure you complete all of these steps. They're all very important, and none of them should be omitted. In the real world, we measure current using a device called an ammeter. We spoke about ammeters when we talked about electric circuits. Ammeters must be connected in series. You must connect an ammeter in series with the current to be measured to ensure that all current moves through the meter. If you're using a device, here are the rules for connecting that device. Your red probe is connected to 10 ADC on the multimeter, and your black probe is connected to COM, or the ground. When drawing a schematic diagram for an ammeter, we use a letter A with a circle around it to represent the ammeter. And it must be in series with, or a straight line, with no junction or other paths, with the device or the load that you want to measure the current from. When measuring potential difference, we're going to use a device called a voltmeter. Most of the devices used to measure electrical quantities contain a voltmeter, an ammeter, and a resistance meter all connected together. When you're using a voltmeter, you must connect it in parallel or across the load you want to measure the voltage of. If you were doing this in the real world, you would have to move the wires. The red probe is connected to V ohm milliamps the dial is turned to 10 dCV, and the black probe connects to the calm, or the ground. And as we mentioned when we were discussing circuit diagrams, you must connect the voltmeter in parallel. The way we draw a voltmeter is the letter V with a circle around it. You're going to place one wire 
on one side of the load that you want to measure the voltage of and another wire on the other side. You're measuring the voltage across these two points. We move on to energy generation. There are two ways to generate electricity. There are non-renewable energy sources. These are energy sources that cannot be renewed or take millions of years to renew naturally. These include fossil fuels, which we burn to release energy and take millions of years to regenerate. Also, nuclear power uses elements that are radioactive that are found naturally in nature. These do not renew. These are called non-renewable energy sources. There are also renewable energy sources. These were highlighted in green because these are forms of green energy. These are energy sources that are unlimited and can be replaced or replenished in a short period of time. There are many types of renewable energy sources and these are great for the environment. They help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, fight global warming and climate change. They include hydroelectric plants, such as the one in Niagara Falls, wind energy, where we use wind turbines to generate electricity. Each of the seven high schools in our system have wind turbines installed to provide renewable energy in part to the school. We have solar energy, We also have geothermal energy. Geothermal energy uses heat in the Earth's crust to generate electricity. And we also have biomass. Biomass is where we use once living materials to produce heat. In table one, we have electricity generation by fuel type. This data was collected in 2019 from energy sources in Ontario. The largest amount of energy production in Ontario comes from non-renewable sources. Nuclear energy at the top with 59%, natural gas at 7%, and petroleum at 0.3%. In Ontario, we also have renewable energy sources that provide energy to our grid. 24% comes from hydroelectricity, 8% comes from wind turbines, 1% from solar energy, and another 1% from biomass or geothermal energy. Our renewable energy generation in Ontario represents 34%. And we're actually trying to increase this over time. We want to make sure that we increase our renewable energy sources because they reduce greenhouse gases, they fight climate change, and global warming. Here are some points about energy generation in Ontario. Three nuclear power plants provide the bulk of Ontario's baseload generation. Bruce Power on the east shore of Lake Huron is the largest. It's one of the largest nuclear power plants currently operating in the world. In 2015, the government approved refurbishing 10 nuclear generation units, six at the Bruce Power site, 
and four at the Darlington site. This $26 billion 15-year program is one of the largest non-emitting energy products projects in North America. Even though nuclear energy is non-renewable and the fuel source doesn't replenish over time, it's a non-emitting energy production. It doesn't release greenhouse gases into the environment. There is the need to store the waste products from nuclear energy, but one major benefit is that it doesn't pollute the air. Ontario has over 200 hydroelectricity generation facilities with a total capacity of 9,160 megawatts. Ontario leads Canada in wind capacity with about 5,060 megawatts of wind capacity. This was added between 2005 and 2019. Ontario had about 97% of Canada's solar capacity in the year 2019. And Ontario has the largest 100% biomass fueled plant in North America. The Atacocan generating station was converted from coal in 2014 to biomass. Where is this energy used? Well, 30% of our energy is used in transportation. 34%, the largest amount, is used in industries across Canada. 20% is used by us in our homes. And 16% is used by commercial retail spaces. We can calculate the electrical efficiency of a device or a process. Most energy that is given off as heat is not used for what it's intended for. We're constantly trying to design more efficient devices to save energy, save money, and protect the planet. The higher the percentage, the more efficient the device is. You can calculate the percent efficiency of a device using the equation percent efficiency is equal to energy out divided by energy in times 100%. This calculation is the same calculation you use to calculate your percentage on a test or a quiz. Energy out is a measure of how much useful energy the device puts out due to, it, to do its task. For example, a light bulb might produce 35 joules of light energy. Energy is, in, energy is a measure of how much energy the device requires. For example, the same light bulb might require 100 joules of electrical energy to produce 35 joules of light. So of the 100 joules, only 35 is output in the form of light. The rest is released as heat or other unusable forms. So we can calculate the efficiency of this light bulb. Let's try. I'm going to highlight important numbers and quantities and units when I read through this sample problem. Calculating the efficiency of a light bulb. A light bulb uses 100 joules of electrical energy and produces 35 joules of light energy. Calculate the percent efficiency of a light bulb. We have two quantities here, 100 joules of energy and 35 joules of energy. Your job is to determine which is the energy out and which is the energy in. So the energy out is the type of useful energy that you are hoping to receive from this process. And energy in is how much energy you use to produce your output. So how do I know which one is energy in and which one's energy out? 
Well, energy out is always the smaller amount. So energy out is 35 joules. And the larger amount is your energy input. This is always the case because no energy transformation is 100% efficient. We always receive a number that is lower. Let's calculate the percentage efficiency and I will tell you a tip on how to make sure you did this correctly. We'll use the equation. Percent efficiency is equal to energy out over energy in times 100%. We'll use our values. Energy out is 35 joules. Energy in is 100 joules. Multiply this by 100%. Punch this into your calculator. 35 divided by 100 times 100. You end up with 35% efficiency. We'll write a therefore statement. Therefore, the light bulb is 35% efficient. How do I know I did this correctly? If you did this correctly, you'll get a value between 0 and 100%. If you did it incorrectly, if you put 100 up top and 35 below, then you'll get an amount that is higher than 100%. This is impossible. No energy process is greater than 100%. In fact, in real life, they're always lower than 100%. So if you got a number that was greater than 100%, just flip these two numbers in the equation and you'll get the right answer. So why are electrical energy conversions not 100% efficient? This is because in all processes, energy is always lost to unusable forms such as heat. We'll try another sample prob problem together, and then I'll leave you to do some of these homework questions yourself. A toaster oven uses 1,200 joules of energy to produce 850 joules of thermal energy. We have two energy quantities, and we have to decide which of these is energy out and which of these is energy in. Remember, the smaller amount is always your out, and the larger amount is always your in. So we have 850 joules as our energy out, and we're putting in 1,200 joules for this toaster oven. So let's calculate our percent efficiency. Percent efficiency is equal to energy out divided by energy in. That's 850 joules divided by 1,200 joules times 100%. Punch this into your calculator and tell me what you get. If you did this correctly, you'll get 70.8% efficiency. Therefore, the toaster oven
is 70.8% efficient. So how do we determine how much energy is wasted? To determine how much energy is wasted, you're going to calculate energy in minus energy out. I'm going to draw a red box around this. I'm going to highlight it in yellow. I'm going to draw a little star so that you can remember that this is where we come to to remember how to calculate the energy wasted. So let's try. 1,200 joules minus 850 joules. Do this subtraction on your calculator to make sure you don't make any mistakes and therefore lose any marks. We find that 350 joules of energy is wasted by the toaster oven. Try these practice problems. Let's look at energy consumption and conservation in the home. A lot of your electrical devices have a hidden consumption or a phantom load. Most TVs, computers, appliances, and other devices have a standby mode. If they have a standby mode, then they are continuing to use energy as long as they are plugged into a wall. We call this hidden energy the phantom load. So what can we do to conserve energy in the home when it comes to hidden consumption and phantom loads? Well, these phantom loads account for as much as 7% of a household's total energy use. To avoid losing energy as phantom load, unplug all electrical devices when they're not in use. Another consideration for energy consumption is the EnerGuide and Energy Star ratings of appliances. It's mandatory for electrical appliances to have EnerGuide labels on them, which tell you how much electrical energy in kilowatt hours you can expect to use in one year. This will allow the consumer to decide which device will consume the least amount of energy, reducing household costs for electricity, as well as making, helping make decisions that are best for the environment. The goal is to have people use the EnerGuide label to make informed buying decisions on efficient appliances, equipment, vehicles, and homes. To help choose, look at the EnerGuide label. Here in large letters and numbers, you will see how much energy is consumed by this device in one year. The smaller this value, the better it is for the environment. So in terms of conservation, a more energy efficient appliance may cost more to purchase than a less efficient model, but it will save money in energy costs and reduce pollution. In terms of energy conservation and energy consumption in the home, we move on to smart meters. Electrical energy consumption is how much en electrical energy is used and as we mentioned, it's measured in kilowatt hours. In Ontario, we utilize the time of use pricing for electrical energy. So people in society have a constant demand for electrical use, and we call this the baseload demand. And this demand varies throughout the day. There are certain times of day when the majority of people are using electricity in their homes or at work, and there are certain times a day when this amount is reduced. 
So the times during the day where the demand for electricity increases is called peak demand. The cost of using electricity increases as demand increases at this peak demand time. So smart meters can record your total energy consumption hour by hour. So different prices for electrical energy can apply at different times of day. If you look at this chart, you can decide when it's best to use energy in your home. Set your dishwasher on a timer so that it can be used at off-peak hours. Wash your clothes at off-peak hours. This will save money, reduce demands. Now, what does this mean for energy conservation? If you use energy during off-peak hours, not only do you save money, but it can also ensure a long-term supply of energy and therefore reduce environmental impact. Not only are you saving money, but you're also saving the environment. Please try the practice questions on electrical quantities below. As well, complete any LMS activities on this section.